Idea is the show where we look at misfires, mistakes, and miscalculations from all throughout history. I'm Tony Southcott. And I'm Albert Berg. And today's episode is brought to you by our featured patron, Globula. Thanks, Globs. This week, we're going to be looking at a historical bad idea, Tony, uh, and a bad idea from ancient, ancient times that is so well known that it has made its way into common usage in language. We're going to be talking about the story behind the Pyrrhic victory. It's a term I've definitely heard before, like a lot of times whenever you're reading like sci-fi books and like there's a hard fought but like costly victory, people always pull that out. Yes, the term Pyrrhic victory, not to spoil the story too much, Tony, but it refers to a victory that was so costly it wasn't worth winning. It's like a win that's not really a win. And that's the kind of concept you can really easily grasp, but, but it comes to us through the exploits of a man named Pyrrhus of Epirus. And Pyrrhus of Epirus grew up in the shadow of Alexander the Great. The region of Epirus had been allied with the Macedonians in the years before and during the conquests of Alexander the Great. Pyrrhus's mother was Alexander's second cousin, and his father was deposed when Pyrrhus was only two years old because he fought an unpopular war to help Alexander's son, Alexander IV, regain his power. Alexander IV is the fourth because there was a lot of Alexanders at the time. I'm not sure Alexander the Great was the first. It's confusing. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm losing a little bit of timeline stuff here. I didn't know. I didn't think Alexander the Great had heirs. He did, but they didn't actually make it into owning any of his kingdom. Pyrrhus is born about four years after Alexander dies. And to my way of thinking, as I'm reading this story, it seems apparent that he really has his eyes on this great conqueror who, I mean, to, even today is incredibly well known as one of the greatest military geniuses of all history. You can imagine his reputation four years after he died was probably pretty high. Yeah, and everybody's living in that shadow wanting to attain some of that, especially as the Macedonian Empire fades. Right, and Pyrrhus is part of this Macedonian Empire states that are sort of allied with Macedon anyway. It's a it's a weird mesh of things that are going on that I am not, as a person who's read up on this story for like a week, really qualified to comment on, but there's some complexity there. But he's at least linked to Macedonia, and he has some of the military of Macedonia, some of the military ideas of Macedonia. He'll be wielding phalanxes in combat. So he is very much a Greek commander in the style of Alexander and with some of the troops that Alexander would have commanded if he had lived longer. Also, as a side note, I am saying Macedonia only because of Dan Carlin. I don't know which is right. Don't at me. Well, you can at me, but still. Yes. Um, <laughs> Tony's not the one who's in charge of getting everything right for this episode anyway, so... <laughs> Despite the fact that his father had been deposed when he was a child, Pyrrhus was eventually returned to the throne of Epirus. But he wasn't content to simply rule the land that he had inherited. Epirus was largely rural, and it was important to the world only because of the oracle at Dodona. And even that was secondary to the more famous oracle at Delphi. Pyrrhus longed to demonstrate his greatness in battle like Alexander before him. He tried to invade Thessaly without success, and for a time he shared co-rulership with Macedonia with Lysimachus, one of Alexander the Great's generals. Once again, not sure if I pronounced that correctly, but it's the last time I'm saying his name in this episode. <laughs> Eventually, though, Pyrrhus was kicked out of this alliance, leaving him once again nothing more than the king of Epirus. But Pyrrhus had a plan. He could take his armies across the sea into the bottom of Italy and push up through the peninsula and possibly beyond, creating a new empire for himself. Now, to give a little sense of the geography here, I hope to have graphics up for the people who are watching this on YouTube. But if you're just listening, the place where Pyrrhus is at, Epirus, is just across the sea near the bottom of Italy's boot. So Epirus, the kingdom that Pyrrhus is king over is there by the heel of Italy 
sort of on the opposite side of the toe, which is kicking towards Sicily. The problem is Italy was largely the domain of the newly emergent Rome. Now, Rome is not the Roman Empire at this point. It's a growing city state that has conquered a lot of the surrounding areas and is conquering them in a way that is beneficial to the city state rather than having all these people in slavery and just beating them down. Rome has this policy of once you're conquered, you're in and you get to enjoying with all of the benefits it means to be a Roman. They're building up roads. They're letting these people share in the spoils of war if they send their soldiers to help them fight. So they're growing at a massive rate, but that news hasn't really reached Macedonia yet. It certainly hasn't reached Pyrrhus. He knows about Rome kinda, but this is the ancient world. They don't have Twitter. They don't have the internet. There's no long range communications. You get sort of whatever the people who have walked from one area to another can tell you. And Pyrrhus thinks these Roman guys, they're upstarts. I'm a Macedonian. I'm related to Alexander the Great. I have the descendants of his army on my side. I can take them. Okay. I'm going to sail right over there. I'm going to conquer my way straight up that peninsula. I'm going to maybe get me a chunk of Sicily and it's going to be awesome. I'm going to be another Alexander the Great. I'm going to conquer my own world. It's got a little bit of that conquer lust going on. He really does. He's always looking throughout his life. He's looking for an excuse to fight. He's not necessarily what I would call a mercenary, but it always seems like when somebody else has a battle, he's right there ready to jump in and be like, oh, oh, I got this. I'm go I can help y'all. <laughs> I mean, at least he's getting some veteran experience. He was. And I, I want to point out before we get very far into this, that this is not going to be a Pyrrhus sucks kind of a story because before he gets to Italy, Pyrrhus has already earned a ton of respect for his men. He is the kind of guy that when you've served under him, you're like, wow. I got to serve under Pyrrhus like that. That was a good gig, you guys. And it's not just his own ego inflating him to think that he's like Alexander the Great. A lot of the soldiers around him and the people who see him fight are also making that comparison. They're saying this guy's smart. He's savvy. He's got that same spark of bravery and go get him. And he's he's just like Alexander. That's what they're saying. And Pyrrhus is thinking about himself and he thinks, yeah, I'm going to do this. So. With his slice of the Greek army that had so recently conquered the world, Pyrrhus thought he had a shot at taking out the Romans. All he needed was an excuse to go to Italy because he's over here in a Pyrrhus, right? He doesn't have jurisdiction in Italy. He doesn't have a reason to go over there and start conquering people without really causing a lot of trouble. But in 282 BC, he gets his excuse. Rome at this point did not control the whole of the Italian peninsula. And there was an independent state in that heel part of the boot near the South called Tarentum and Tarentum didn't trust the rapidly expanding reach of the Roman nascent empire. So when Rome parked several ships in the Bay of Tarentine, where they were specifically not supposed to park ships based on an ancient treaty they had with the Tarentines, the people of Tarentum got really mad and sunk the ships. There's several different stories about why Rome put the ships there, but it seems like they were probably wanting to pick a fight to me, Tony. They had stories like, well, one of our generals was just on vacation with four <laughs> battleships in Tarentine. Some Gulf of Tonkin action. Just like, we're going to put this right here and wait. They also had a story about how maybe they were going to negotiate with some of Tarentum's neighbors, but regardless, they knew what they were doing before they went and parked in the Tarentine Bay and the Tarentines knew what they were doing when they sunk these battleships. So they're in it now. They, they don't have much of a choice. They could, there's a part of the story where Tarentum can maybe just say, Hey, Rome, listen, you guys sent your ships here this way. We sunk them because it was against the treaty, but we're actually not 
like wanting war? Can we work something out? And that's a position that several of the citizens of Tarentum took, specifically the older, more wealthy people who didn't want to see a war just wreck everything that they had built. The younger folks, though, that were all excited about breaking things up and having change, they won out in the end, and they decided that they were going to go to war with Rome. And obviously they couldn't go to war alone, they're just little puny Tarentum, so they call their good friend Pyrrhus and ask for help. Now, Pyrrhus at this point has a choice to make. He's got this plan where he wants to conquer through Italy and have his own empire. And he has this advisor named Sinius. And this advisor named Sinius is a very wise dude from everything that I can tell. And Sinius says to him, don't go. Do not go and try to conquer Italy. It's a bad move. And Pyrrhus is like, why? I, I got it. I'm going to go like, it's going to be awesome. We can win this one, Sinius. And Sinius firstly is like, I don't know, man, these Romans, they seem like they might be a handful, but also he says to Pyrrhus, what are you going to do when you get over there? And Pyrrhus says, well, I'm going to set up camp in Tarentum. And he says, so what are you going to do next? He says, well, I'm going to go and fight the Romans. And he says, well, what are you going to do next? He says, well, I'm going to, Go to Sicily and conquer over there. And he runs him through all of these plans that he has for his military conquests. And when he finally runs him down out of all the lands he wants to conquer, he says, and what are you going to do next? And Pirate answers, quote, we shall be much at ease and we'll drink bumpers, my good man, every day. And we'll gladden one another's hearts with confident talks. Man, I could use a bumper right now. I don't, I, I assume that that's a word for an alcoholic drink, Tony. I, yeah, I mean, I'm guessing it's probably like wine or something like that, but still. But Sinius replies to this with, quote, Surely this privilege is ours already, and we have at hand, without taking any trouble, those things to which we hope to attain by bloodshed and great toils and perils, after doing much harm to others and suffering much ourselves. I mean, he's got a point. <laughs> Yeah, he's like, listen, let's look at this from the 10,000 foot view. You are a king. You have access to basically everything that anybody in this period of time could have access to. You have wine, women, and song at your fingertips. You probably have a pretty sweet digs. All you have to do is maintain and you'll be cool. But Pyrrhus, again, probably feeling the shadow of Alexander the Great looming large over him, does not listen. He goes and consults at the Oracle of Delphi, which I will point out is not the Oracle that is in Epirus, but it is the Oracle that Alexander went to when he was told he would conquer the world. And he received the message from the Oracle, quote, I say, Pyrrhus, that you, the Romans, can conquer, end quote which is one of those delightful sayings of the Oracle that can be read in at least two different ways. It sounds like she was cold reading and just trying to get that nice tip at the end of like a normal tarot card reading. Well, so obviously she probably knows that he wants to conquer the Romans, but you, the Romans can conquer it. It could mean that he is going to conquer the Romans or it me could mean the Romans can conquer him. I don't know if the construction works in the original language as well as it does in English, but again, it seems pretty squishy. You could get a lot of results out of that one. Yep. Despite the fact that the seas were much more treacherous in the winter, Pyrrhus mustered his army and set sail immediately. And he ran into trouble when the storms that everybody knew were much worse during the winter scattered his fleet across the Mediterranean Sea. Of the 20,000 infantry, 2,000 archers, 500 slingers, and 3,000 cavalry, and 20 elephants that he started out with, Pyrrhus ended up literally swimming ashore in Italy, followed closely by 2,000 infantry, two elephants, and a few cavalry. Oof. That's just a lot of lost men and horses. Holy crap. Well, they weren't lost completely. The storm broke up the fleet. It didn't sink Many of them, if any, they're just scattered across the Mediterranean. So Pyrrhus gets to Tarentum. He crawls into the city with his few men. He sets up camp. He does some smart stuff politically here, which isn't really part of the story, but it's fascinating to me, at least, that 
while he is not completely backed by his forces, he's very gentle with the people people of Tarentum. He's going to need them to shape up and back the war effort in a little bit, but he doesn't start throwing down austerity measures until his whole army is there. And then he says, Hey guys, guys, y'all got to shape up. Okay. <laughs> and they might be mad at him at that point, but they can't do much because they called him and he's there with a bunch of people who could kill him. Leadership. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Rome marshaled their forces against Pyrrhus, and the two enemies met for the first time at Heraclea, near the Battle of Cyrus. Rome won the first skirmish of the battle by routing a small force of infantry that Pyrrhus had put in place in an attempt to keep the Romans from crossing the river. And this was Pyrrhus's first look at the Roman army. He hadn't encountered them up until now beyond hearsay, and when he sees them crossing the river, he suddenly realizes exactly what kind of force he's up against. He's so impressed with their precision and with their level of engineering, because I assume they either have boats or bridges or whatever, me whatever method you're using to get an entire army across the river is probably going to involve some kind of discipline and engineering. And the Romans just have it down to a science. Pyrrhus is very impressed with them when he first contacts them. Despite the fact that Rome has shown themselves to be a formidable foe, Pyrrhus was able to distract their advancement until he could get his armies in place the way he wanted them. And the real battle took place on the next day. For the first time in history, the Roman legion would face the Macedonian phalanx in battle. And the two armies smashed into each other over and over again throughout the day with little progress being made on either side. The ancient historians that I read said that there were seven attacks from both sides and all of them failed. So you essentially have these big blocks of phalanx spear wielding Greeks that are coming up against these big legions of Romans and they just sort of smack into each other over and over and over again and nothing really gets accomplished. Yeah, they're using such similar tactics. It's like you have to do something that's actually going to break a phalanx. Otherwise, you're just bumping phalanxes. <laughs> they were bumping phalanxes all over the place. And <laughs> at this point, it, things almost go south for Pyrrhus because there's a rumor that spreads through the ranks that he has died in battle. Somebody who looks like him, uh, the historians at the time say that his armor bearer actually had put on his armor to avoid Pyrrhus himself being targeted by the other army and he had died. But the result of this was that Pyrrhus's troops are freaked out because they're like, we can't do this without Pyrrhus. Pyrrhus is dead. We're dead. And Pyrrhus has one of those great cinematic moments that you really see like in like movies most of the time. The, the end of Return of the King comes to mind when Aragon rides his horse down in front of the whole army of Rohan and all the other armies of men, right? Spurring them to action. Pyrrhus does that. Right. He takes his helmet off so that they can all see his face. And he's like, I'm not dead. And you're not dead yet either. Go get him. Or words to that effect. <laughs> An orator you are. And you mentioned that somebody needed to do something to break up the monotony of the battle, to, to change the game here a little bit. And Pyrrhus has that game changing element. Pyrrhus has elephants. Elephants were a wild card in battles of the time for the people who they were being deployed against, especially the Romans in this battle, they could be a complete surprise. Imagine having never seen an elephant before and you're in battle. So there is the very real chance that you could be killed by something, but you're at least expecting to be killed by a sword or a spear or a flying arrow or maybe being trampled by a horse. And all of a sudden in the distance, you see this giant gray tusked monstrosity that looks like nothing you've ever seen and is twice as big as any animal you have any knowledge of. And it's charging towards you. And then imagine you have all of that. And you're also a horse. <laughs> The horses could not handle the elephants. The horses immediately freaked out. And the Romans were relying pretty heavily on cavalry at this point. So when Pyrrhus deploys the elephants, the Roman cavalry is just shot. 
And this creates a retreat for the Romans, which if you're a student of ancient history, you know that this is when generally the most casualties are inflicted. When one army turns around and starts running away, all of a sudden they've lost their defensive posture. They're not in formation anymore. And they're easy pickings for the other army if they are still in formation. One thing saves the Romans, and it's the same thing that doomed the Romans, because these elephants, despite the fact that they are huge and scary, and if they get you, they will really kill you, are also pretty difficult to control. They're not well trained for battle at this point, and one of them gets a little bit out of hand and actually diverts Pyrrhus's forces who are trying to chase the Romans down, and the Romans are able to get away more cleanly than they would have. Yeah, otherwise it would have been like an outright rout. No, the Romans would go on against Hannibal and other forces to have weird side tactics that they would use against uh, elephants, usually involving setting greased pigs on fire because it would just freak the elephants out too much to fight. We'll get to some fun anti-elephant tactics in a little bit, but to give a rundown of how things stand after this battle, the Romans had lost 7,000 men and Pyrrhus had only lost 3,000. Now that sounds pretty good, right? From a math standpoint, you killed twice as many of their guys as your guys were killed. But herein lies the problem for Pyrrhus throughout the war. The Romans can call for reinforcements. They are within land marching distance of many, many allies who can send them more people. Pyrrhus is across the sea from all of his allies. And he ain't getting no more people. Yeah, that's like weeks to even send the message to get more people if he had more people to bring. Right. There's a possibility that maybe he can negotiate for more troops eventually. But in the now, Pyrrhus is stuck with what he has. So those 3000 that he lost, he can't get them back. Pyrrhus in this moment sees negotiation as his best chance for victory. He understands the position that he's in militarily and he decides that while he has the upper hand he's going to try to get peace on his terms at least like maybe he's not going to conquer the whole peninsula right now but we can have a win at least and be set up here and the people of Tarentum will accept me and I'll have furthered my empire and maybe now I can go to Sicily and conquer over there for a while and then maybe we'll come back to for the Romans later but we'll we'll just sort of put that off for a future date. He sends the advisor we talked about earlier, Cineus, to Rome to try and broker a peace deal. And Cineus had negotiated successfully for Pyrrhus before Often enough that it was said of Cineus, more cities had been won for him, that is Pyrrhus, by the eloquence of Cineus than by his own arms. Which is a pretty good place to be in if you're Cineus, honestly. Pyrrhus looks yeah. at him and he's like, I've got armies of thousands and you've been able to get more just by talking smooth than they have. <laughs> Sounds like a guy you want on your team. He was and Cineus goes to Rome and talks to the Romans, and he's almost convinced the Romans. Like, he says, listen, you guys weren't in control of this area anyway, so it's no big deal. Maybe Pyrrhus can stay. Let's have some peace here. And he's almost got them convinced. And then this one old guy who's, like, housebound, right? He's a senator, but he almost never shows up to the Senate because he's old and sick and stuff. He gets on his litter, right? He has... People pick him up and tote him into the Senate. And I, I'm sorry, I don't have his name in my notes here. But he says, guys, if you let this guy stay, he is not going to be happy staying down south. He will come and bite us. We have to get rid of him. There cannot be peace while Pyrrhus stays in Italy. And he sways the conversation back away from Cineus's arguments. And the Romans kick Cineus out. And they say, go tell your boss. We ain't doing it. And Sidious was very impressed by the Romans, by the way. At, at this point, he goes back to Pyrrhus and he says, they're like a city of kings. And Pyrrhus asks him what he means. And Sidious thinks about it for a minute. He says, actually, they're like a city of generals. They're, they're all real good dudes is what I'm saying, Pyrrhus. You might want to rethink this. But Pyrrhus doesn't rethink, right? He, he, despite the fact that 
The tragedy of this story is that nobody listens to Sinius. Pyrus doesn't <laughs> listen to Sinius. The, Roman does, the Romans don't listen to Sinius. So much would have been different if Sinius had been able to convince these guys to be level-headed. But Pyrus decides that he is going to march on Rome. And he sets his force in motion to do exactly that. He marches north and he's conquering cities as he goes and he's taking spoils. And that actually turns out to be his downfall in this march because he is so successful in the march toward Rome that he has spoils that weigh down his army and force him to stop before he actually reaches Rome. At this point, because everybody's fighting out in the open with, you know, people and on the dirt and stuff, the weather matters a lot and winter is coming on and Pyrus has to stop before winter sets in and he makes it to within 20 miles of Rome. His army is like right there at the doorstep, but they can't seal the deal and he ends up having to make camp. That's like within viewing distance of Rome. That's so close. It's a lot like some of the stuff that you will read about in the Civil War, where the some of the armies of the South almost make it up to Washington, right? That they're, I think, within a similar distance, within 20 or 30 miles, or maybe even within five or six miles. I, I seem to remember a story of people in Washington going to view a battle from a hill and having a picnic while people were shooting each other sort of just over the ridge I always figured that, like, the smell alone would keep you from wanting that picnic. Uh, the smell doesn't become a problem until afterwards. Yeah, that's true. Maybe the horses a little bit, but you're used to that, and the gun smoke and gunpowder has kind of an invigorating smell if you're into that kind no, of thing. No, I'm talking about, like, the in-between where everybody's guts are spilling out. Yes, afterwards, you definitely don't want to be there for that. Gettysburg was a problem with that, or it just stank from all the poop. And all the <laughs> corpses. People don't think about poop in these situations, but everybody pooping and not a lot of toilets. Yeah, I imagine that the Persians, when they brought two million people to Greece, had some issues with sanitation. When the winter had passed, the Romans marched out to rid themselves of Pyrrhus once and for all. This time, Pyrrhus wouldn't have the element of surprise with his elephants. Over the winter, the Romans had built 300 specially designed anti-elephant battle wagons. I don't have a picture of these things, Tony, really even in my mind, but they are described as having flaming spikes that are sticking out the front. They have some kind of weird arms with blades on them that swing out the sides. They have these specially designed grappling hook throwers and the grappling hooks are on fire and they have space for archers in these things. So these that are sounds just like an early, like choppy tank. It's awesome. Maybe not so much with the defense side of things. Cause I would, I can't imagine these things are even easy to steer much less defend, but at the very least, it seems like it's a good attempt, right? You're trying a lot of weird things to, to maybe deal with these elephants. Maybe they'll be afraid of the fire. Maybe you'll hit them in the head with one of these flaming grappling guns or like catch their ears or something. They, they do deploy these against the elephants and they don't work as well as you would hope in this situation. I, I despite the fact that it's a cool image, the elephants actually do pretty well. The, these battle wagons or whatever you want to call them, they are not quite as effective as the Romans were hoping. But what the Romans do do well in this battle is they manage to, on the first day of fighting, position themselves in a place that's disadvantageous for Pyrrhus. Pyrrhus's whole setup involves being able to meet with people on an open plain, right? The phalanx is this big block of men that all need to march together, and these elephants are giant big things. And so what the Romans do is they say, listen, if you're gonna fight like that, we're gonna go a place where you can't fight like that. So they go into the forest, where the phalanx doesn't work because everybody can't be shoulder to shoulder because there's trees everywhere. The elephants are bumping into everything or just can't make it through these trees. It's a pretty thick forest. And they make decent work of Pyrrhus's men on the first day. But Pyrrhus, again, no fool he, decent military commander throughout this story, manages on the second day to get his guys 
placed in the forest in such a way that they flush the Romans out and put them on the field of battle exactly where Pyrrhus wants them and where he can do more damage with his elephants and with his phalanxes. Now, there's some disagreement about the ultimate outcome of this battle. Some ancient historians say that Pyrrhus outright lost this battle, but in the more commonly told version of the story, Pyrrhus is once again victorious over the Romans. He, he beats them back. He has fewer casualties. The Romans have 6,000 casualties, but Pyrrhus has 3,500. But again, you have this weird thing where despite the fact that Pyrrhus is evidently a brilliant military leader, and despite the fact that he's losing far fewer troops than the Romans are, he just can't afford these losses. And this is where the idea of the Pyrrhic victory comes from in legend. We can't be sure that this exactly happened the way that it did, but it's fun to think that it did. And so we're going to say it as if it was true, Tony. After this battle, it is said by legend, at least, and I hope that it's true, Tony, because it's fun to think that it's true, that somebody's congratulating Pyrrhus on his victory. And Pyrrhus responds, quote, if we are victorious in one more battle with the Romans, we shall be utterly ruined. End quote. <laughs> and Pyrrhus at this point realizes he can't keep fighting the Romans. He's got to go somewhere else and do something else. So he takes his army to Sicily and there he does a pretty decent job. He's helping some other people out against their oppressors, right? He's, he's got this idea of, I can jump in where people are needing a general. And then maybe if I win enough battles there, then I will leverage myself up to being able to be in charge. And he does a decent job in Sicily. He conquers almost everything he wants to, except for one city that he's not able to quite siege out. And three years later, he comes back to Rome. And in those three years, the people of Tarentum have gotten really annoyed with Pyrrhus because he's just sort of skipped out on him and said, all right, I'm going to Sicily. You guys Bye." Can't handle the Romans. And when he comes back, Rome comes out and actually does defeat him. Pyrrhus is defeated by Rome. He goes on to have more military career. He doesn't die at this defeat. He goes back to Epirus. He fights various battles. And his end is kind of ironic. It's like the end of a Coen Brothers movie, Tony. If you want to know how Pyrrhus dies, it's it's not like in some glorious battle. At, at the end of this sort of long and storied career where this man was known for his bravery and for his tactical sense. He ends up fighting in the narrow streets of the city of Argos. And there's an old woman on a roof with a tile who just throws the tile down and smacks Pyrus on the head. And that's the end of Pyrus. That lady, like she was just full on dead eye with that tile. I'm just imagining it right now. The interesting twist is, he probably wasn't killed by the tile. He had a soldier who was fighting with him who saw him get hit with the tile. He's unconscious and the soldier kills Pyrus. He decapitates him so that, and this is my interpretation, probably because he didn't want it to be said that Pyrus was killed by an old lady with the ceiling tile. So it would be better to kill, be killed by one of your own soldiers than just die ignobly in some streets after you got hit in the head. But that is all I have for the story of Pyrrhus and his Pyrrhic victory. Or Pyrrhic victory? I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, Tony. But I don't think any of his relatives are going to write in and complain. Because it's been a while. The bad idea here is underestimating your opponent. It's easy to see why Pyrrhus would think that he could take the Roman Empire. They were relative upstarts at this time. And Pyrrhus had Macedonian blood in his veins. The blood of Alexander the Great. But... In spite of that, it's worth considering, if you're going to go be a general, you might not be Alexander the Great. You might be close. You might be real good. But there's probably some battles that you're not going to win. And you need to have a contingency for that. Yeah, and the whole, like, bringing your entire army and not having backups against a nation that can just bring that many more. It just doesn't seem like the math worked out for him. I don't know that he could have done anything differently. Like I'm sure he got as many people as he could. And I'm sure he had some people in reserve at various points, but in my mind, he did the best that he could with the circumstances that he had, but really he should have just listened to Sinius and stayed home. 
Thank you guys so much for listening. If you enjoyed this, don't forget to tell a friend about us. You can subscribe to us on whatever podcast platform you're on or over on the YouTube channel. And if you really love us, you should go to patreon.com slash human echoes and become a patron today to help support this show. Also, if you have bad ideas that you would like us to cover, you can send them to bad ideas show at gmail.com and we will take a look at them and see if we like them and maybe they'll be on the show. Thanks guys. Bye.